<laughs> and we know in Buddhism that, right, we're all equals, we're all contributing to uh, our awakening and the awakening of others in all of the different ways that we act. I Happy New Year first to all of you. It's um, wonderful to see you all. Um, I thought maybe I'd be doing this from home this morning. I thought, you know, they were saying eight or nine inches of snow and uh, I thought even though I live very close, I thought maybe it would be hard to get here, but uh, I guess fortunately we got a really nice dusting of snow, maybe three inches, four inches, it's not too bad. So I was able to come and uh, be here, which is nice. Most of you are online, there's just a couple, uh, three of us here in the center, but um, it's still very nice to be here in the center and to see all of your faces um, online. Um, as Michael said, I want to talk this morning about noble friendship. And whenever I'm about to do a, a Sunday Zen talk, um, well, I shouldn't say whenever I'm about to. What I do throughout, you know, part of my practice is just really paying attention to ideas or topics that capture me. And then I want to study them a little bit more. I want to learn something a little bit more about them. And that's what happened with Noble Friendship. I heard somebody interviewed who had written a book recently that um, is sort of based on Noble Friendship. And I thought, that's a really interesting idea. I've heard of it. You know, I've heard some of the, sut the one of the sutras that I'm going to talk um, about. I've heard that too, but I haven't really thought about this concept very deeply. So I wanted to do that. Um, so noble friendship. It's also called admirable friendship, spiritual friendship. You know, what what is it? And I, and I want to start, as I said, by sharing a a scripture or a Buddhist uh, sutra on this uh, that many of you are probably familiar with. And it includes a, a character, an individual whose name is Ananda. And Ananda was a very close attendant of the Buddhas. Um, and by attendant, I take that to mean that, you know, he was um, someone who took care, was by Buddha's side when all the travel that Buddha would do, all the speaking he would do, he would make sure that he had what he needed. Um, he would sometimes serve as a sort of um, interlocutor between Buddha and, and others who would want to come to see him. So he was really close, intimately close with Buddha. And Ananda sa says, um, or the sutra says, then the venerable Ananda approached the Buddha, prostrated himself, and sat down to one side. Sitting there, the venerable Ananda said to the Buddha, Half of this holy life, Lord, is good and noble friendship, companionship with the good, association with the good. So Ananda says again, half of this holy life is noble friendship. And the Buddha responds, do not say that, Ananda. Do not say that, Ananda. It is the whole of this holy life, this friendship, companionship, and association with the good. So the Buddha is saying that good and noble friends are the entirety of the holy life. Not meditating or studying, but noble friendship. I'm interested if any of you have an immediate reaction to that or what you think the Buddha was pointing to when he was saying noble friendship is the whole the entirety of the holy life. Does anybody have any, uh, any comment or thought on that? Just raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Oh, I'm not sure you can, yeah, yeah Tanya. Yes, yeah, so this is something that I have been thinking about a lot lately. And to me, it seems that um, part of the concept of friendship is hardwired into us biologically. Being a bio biologist, I cannot fail by insist on that. I think that we are group animals. We have evolved as grouped animals, same as doggies, but we are different um, in being more versatile. But still, of all the pets that we have, we are best friends with another group animal, which is dog. It's like we have the most, the closest um, 
back and forth relationship with them. Anyways, so I think that part of it is hardwired. And I think that that is something that we should not ignore because it is the basis that we have to work from and work with. So I think that being friends with other people is crucial for our health in every respect. And the organ for friend, for having a friendship organ, which is an immaterial, uh, equal, uncorporeal organ, is something that we have evolved, just as we have evolved to have a spleen. Okay. So I think that that is something where we are, uh, where Buddhism is actually pushing us to develop that further, to further refine it. And that is, I think, marvelous. And I, and I love that quote that you started with. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. And it looks like you have your noble friend right there. <laughs> did, did anybody else want to comment on that? Why, why the Buddha might have said that noble friendship is, is the whole of holy life? Yeah, Robin. Well, I, I think the really interesting, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think the really interesting part of this is noble. And um, it's not just any friendship. It's a noble friendship. And I would think that we would have to live the precepts and, uh, in order to have really a noble friendship. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So in this famous sutra, the Buddha is returning to a dominant theme found throughout the Pali Canon. Human beings are social animals, right? And our greatest survival tool in our physical attributes um, isn't found in our physical attributes. Uh, we don't outrun predators. We don't have claws for fighting. We don't have wings for flight and so on, but we have survived and thrived as a species due to our remarkable abilities to bond and maintain relationships. And connection with others has led to life and survival. Disconnection would lead to our death. And I think the Buddha is reminding uh, or removing, removing Ananda's idea that the Sangha and the Dharma are separate. Right, because he's, he's sort of saying, Ananda said the Sangha is half of the holy life. And one might as assume that he's saying the Dharma is the other half. But Buddha is removing that and he's saying the Sangha is not merely helpful in realizing our path to liberation, but the Sangha is the path. Noble friendship, spiritual friendship, those are the path to our liberation. Our relationships and how we treat one another, how we engage with one another, how we care for one another. This is not simply a good or ethical thing to do, although it may be that as well, but this is the path to our waking up, our waking up from the, the delusion that we might live in and freeing us from suffering. And I'm not sure this is how I typically thought about waking up, that it happens through noble friendship. So let me share an abbreviated version of another sutra. Um, and I'm not sure I can pronounce this right, but it's called the Maghya, Maghya Sutta. It tells the story of an eager young monk, Mahia, who wanted to practice meditation alone in an especially peaceful and beautiful mango grove. He asks the Buddha several times if he can excuse himself to go to this grove to meditate, but repeatedly the Buddha bids him to stay. Finally, the Buddha says, go, go. You can imagine the guy keeps bothering him. And so the monk goes to the mango grove to meditate, but his meditation turns out to be anything but peaceful. To his shock, he finds his mind a snarl of malicious, lustful, and confused thoughts. In the sutra, he states, how amazing, how astounding, even though it was through faith that I went forth from home 
to this homeless life, to this mango grove, to, to meditate alone. Still, I am overpowered by these three kinds of unskillful thoughts, thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of doing harm. So when Mahia rushed back to report his confusing experience, Buddha was not surprised. He took the opportunity to give this teaching. The Buddha said, five factors or qualities induce release of the heart and lasting peace. The Buddha told him, first, a lovely intimacy with good friends. Second, virtuous conduct. Third, frequent conversations that inspire and encourage practice. Fourth, diligence, energy, and enthusiasm for the practice of the good. And fifth, insight into impermanence. Mm. Then, for Mahia's, the monk's further benefit, and to cement the point, the Buddha goes through the list again this time preceding each of the other items with the first. When there is a lovely intimacy between friends, then there is virtuous conduct. When there is a lovely intimacy be friend, be, between friends, then there will be easy opportunities for conversation that inspires and encourages practice. When there is a lovely intimacy between friends, then one's persistence will be aroused for abandoning unskillful qualities and taking on skillful qualities. When there is a lovely intimacy between friends, then one will become discerning, endowed with the discernment, discernment related to impermanence. So it seems that the Buddha is saying that friendship is the most important element in the spiritual path because if it is truly a noble, admirable friendship, all other skillful means naturally flow from it. Does that make sense from what I shared? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Throughout the Buddha's teaching career, he spoke again and again about the pivotal importance of admirable friends in the path to awakening, stating that there is no other factor so conducive to the arising of the eightfold noble path as good friendship. He, quote, this is from the Buddha, just as the dawn is the forerunner of the sunrise, so good friendship is the forerunner of the noble eightfold path. And of course, as we know, the eightfold path is the path to eliminate suffering right action, right speech, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right effort, right concentration, right view or understanding, and right intention. And I want to take just a quick moment here to always remind us that when we in Buddhism talk about eliminating suffering, we are not saying that we will never have another challenge in our life. We are not saying that there won't be pain in our life. You know, there's that saying that said, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. So this initial pain is always, we're, we're gonna have that in our life, but we cause ourselves additional suffering by the way that we relate to that pain, by the way that we tell stories about that pain, by the way that we, we reinforce that, uh, that pain by the stories that we tell ourselves. So when we're talking about eliminating suffering, we're talking about removing that additional layer that we sort of put on top of the real challenges that we experience in our life. So it's real, that's a really important distinction, I think, because to think that Buddhism is about having a life of no trouble is a real distortion, right? So I think if we're not careful, at least I'm gonna talk about myself, if I'm not careful sometimes, it's easy to think of our practice in a solitary or individual way. You know, surely in the popular imagination, the Buddhist monastic is solitary, right? I mean, all the images are of, of one Buddha or one monk sitting on top of a mountain. And teachings on mindfulness meditation 
can seem to emphasize a focus on oneself. We sit in silence. We emphasize becoming intimate with ourselves. When we chant the Bodhisattva vows at the end of the Sunday sitting, like we just did here, we might even be thinking that we have personal, individual responsibility for freeing all sentient beings. In addition, most mindfulness courses that are popular today um, in the general culture, they really focus strongly on sitting meditation practice, right? Um, and yet meditation instructions actually make up a very small percentage of the Buddha's teachings. I read that one estimate that 90% of the texts in the Pali Canon, where the early teachings of Buddha are found, are stories about being in relationship, stories that teach us about how to be with each other in the most enlightened way possible. So think about it. I mean, we, um, the Eightfold Noble Path that I just men mentioned, the six paramitas, or, or the six perfections, as some of you might know them, the precepts, as Robin mentioned, all of these practices are like the user's manual for how we interact with the world, help us step out of our egocentric point of view. And so meditation and dharma study are absolutely necessary, but they aren't sufficient to our spiritual awakening. Um, I might not have understood that when I first came to the meditation center some 10 plus years ago. Um, and even today, I can still have a tendency to fall back into thinking that if I meditate more minutes or if I meditate more days in a row, that somehow that's the ticket to my spiritual awakening. You know, it's very easy to fall back into this meditation is the panacea. But in reality, it is in the world, in our relationships with others, friends, family, and even other people who we don't know that well, that we practice the Dharma, that we practice the precepts, that we practice the uh, six paramitas. And teachings on friendships are saying that these relationships are essential to our awakening. I wanna do a quick sidebar or a brief side, Side note, I, I mentioned that most of the mindfulness classes that are taught today are focused very much on meditation only. And I think that's true, and certainly in the way that I see them advertised. And I wanted, the side note I want to make is that I'm very happy to say that that's not the way we teach here at the Zen Center. For those of you who have taken the foundations of mindfulness, you know that we um, that the teachings are embedded and surrounded by teachings that indirectly and directly cultivate skill, our skillful behavior for our interpersonal relationships. We teach and practice loving kindness meditation uh, for ourselves and others. We emphasize uh, compassion for ourselves and others. But um, I think that's a little different than some of the more standalone meditation classes that are out there. So if, if in fact relationships are essential to our awakening, um, it makes these last two plus years a little all the more um, challenging for us, doesn't it? You know, that we haven't had the opportunity to be with others as much as we might like. We've been constrained in our ability to gather here as a sangha. Zoom has been a lifesaver in that regard. It is not the same as being together. It's just not. Even right now, I can see all of you, but it's different than the energy I feel when I'm with you in person. Nonetheless, I know sitting with all of you in the commit to sit has been so important to me. I, I know that at the very beginning of the pandemic I, and the commit to sit started, I thought, oh, well, that's nice, but I'm just going to sit by myself, you know. I didn't sit or I didn't sit as much. Being able to sit with those of you who are part of the Commit to Sit, um, I am not quite as regular as some of you, but it's been so important to me. And yesterday, during the Saturday morning check-in um, for the Commit to Sit group, we sort of talked about that. Um, we sort of talked about the fact that 
even seeing your little square, there's some connection, there's some bond, and that helps motivate me and inspire me and warms my heart to see you. So that's part of this noble friendship that we're talking about. And I know that those people who were at the Commit to Sit yesterday were sort of saying the same thing. So I ask myself, do I truly appreciate how important each of you is to my own spiritual awakening? You know, I hope that I do. I'm thinking about that a little different these days after having prepared for this class, for this talk this morning. So if it's true that spiritual friendships are important to my awakening, those, those of others, then I need to look at my own offering. <laughs> like, how do I strengthen my own gift of friendship that I am offering? Uh, the Buddha provided teachings on this too, on, on what traits a good friend embodies. In another sutra, he said that a good friend embody, embodies the following virtues. So you might just think about this yourself as I'm saying these, like are these things that I embody in my friendships? First, a friend is helpful, um, is a refuge when you're frightened, when a need arises gives you twice the wealth required. Second, a, friend, a good friend shares one's happiness and one's suffering. A good friend, re under this, he, it's included that, uh, that a uh, friend reveals their secrets to you and guards your secrets. And when I hear that word secrets, I think that what is being said here is, you know, when you have a good friendship, a good friendship is supported by openness and vulnerability with each other, that we're not guarded, that we're not defended, but that we open our heart and share from our heart, and that when another does that with us, that we are protective of that information, and we, we, we provide a container that that person can feel safe with. Third, a noble friend points out what is good discourages you from doing evil things, points out the path of love and compassion. Fourth, a good friend is sympathetic, does not rejoice in your m misfortune, stops those who speak poorly of you, and commends those who speak praise of you. A second teaching around the qualities of a worthy friend um, is another sutta. Uh, it's called the Mitta Sutta. And it's uh, the, I'm not sure if this is the Buddha, but monks, a friend endowed with seven qualities is worth associating with. Which seven? They give what is hard to give. They do what is hard to do. They endure what is hard to endure. They reveal their secrets to you. They keep your secrets. And when misfortune strikes, they don't abandon you. When you're down and out, they don't look down on you. A friend endowed with these seven qualities is worth associating with. So you can hear the similarities between the two. You know, notice that there's no mention of being well-versed in the Dharma. There's no mention of having mastery of meditation or possessing great wisdom. Friendship, the Buddha knew, is far more foundational and simple. Once we get in the idea in our head that so-and-so is more spiritual, so I want to be good friends with them, um, we're on the wrong path. Seek out the simpler qualities in others, such as their service, their kindness, discretion, fortitude, and generosity and exemplify those qualities in what you offer to others. So as I've been thinking about this, I, some layers of this teaching have sort of emerged for me. First, I think it's really important that we make friends with ourselves. Absolutely essential that we make friends with ourselves. Most of us have had moments of treating ourselves like someone we don't like. We're judgmental. We're critical of ourselves. We don't give ourselves much grace or compassion. 
and we can be super judgy and critical of ourselves, which is correlated with being super judgy and critical of other people. They just go together. You're not going to only do it to yourself. You're going to do it to others. And if you don't do it to them in their face, verbally, you're going to do it in your head. So we need to help ourselves learn to be kind and gentle. Uh, friend, we need to be friendly to the voice inside of us that is critical and judgy. Sort of ask it what it needs to be, uh, what, what, what might help it be a little bit more kind to you. There's almost an alchemy that occurs, at least I've noticed this, that when I am kinder to myself, I'm kinder to others. When I offer simple compassion to myself, my heart opens up. And when my heart opens up and softens, then it opens up and softens in the way I interact with other people, too. You know, but when I'm sort of tight and critical and judgy of myself, my heart is closed. And it can't be closed for me and open for other people. It just doesn't work that way. So I need to be reminded of this regularly, but I have evidence, my own evidence, from practicing compassion for myself that this, it works like this. So making friends with ourselves is truly essential to being able to offer the gift of admirable friendship to others. And I, I want to put in a plug for the Foundations of Mindfulness course here, which um, there is a course coming up starting this Thursday, that it provides a good base for this. It provides a good base for us to learn to look at ourselves with a little more compassion and generosity. So that's the first thing I was thinking about in terms of this friendship, is that we have to make friends with ourselves. And then the second is, of course, the second layer is making friends, learning to be friends with others, learning to be a noble friend for others. And I thought to myself that friendship is really a practice, like so much of the other areas of Buddhism. Um, and we, we practice it not because we should, but because we want to. It restores our access to full, our full humanity. And we have the Buddha's guidance on this that I shared a few minutes ago. And we have the Eightfold Path, and we have the Paramitas that I've mentioned, and the precepts, all of which I encourage you to learn more about if, if, you know, if that's of interest to you. But all of them sort of point, give us guidelines and guideposts to how we can live an ethical life and how we can live with others um, in a way that's generous and kind. So I want to share, in addition to those though, I wanted to share a more, a more personal guide that I use in my relationships that I think is relative to this practice, uh, to this topic. So about three years ago, one of our Zen members, Steve Parker, who many of you know, um, he's a psychotherapist, and he gave a talk at the public library about um, peaceful families. He also gave a similar talk here at the Zen Center that some of you might have heard. Um, but at the public library talk that I went to, while he was specifically focusing on family, um, the family unit, I think that this really um, carries beyond that to all relationships. From that talk, I took the following. He said, we can have emotion-driven relationships or we can have principle-driven relationships. And if we have emotion-driven relationships, we're gonna, they are going to be reactive and contain a battle of realities. Because we're operating from our reactive part of our brain. A principle-driven relationship are going to be driven by your principles, right? So if your principles are to be kind and respectful, you make a choice, a decision, an intention to behave with these principles in all your relationships. And here's the point that really stuck with me. He said, no matter what. <laughs> no matter what. You accept 100% responsibility for your communication and your behavior, and you don't blame others 
for your communication and behavior. So, you know, that, again, that no matter what was a game changer for me. It meant that even when I felt justified, <laughs> I needed to act by my principles, or my values, you might say. Even when I'm tired, even when I'm, you know, fill in the blank, no matter what, I make an intention to behave and act from my principles. And that means you have to be clear about your principles, right? So you've got to write them down. You've got to think about them. Some of you may sort of know your principles and values, have embodied them, and be able to, to live from them easily. I needed to write them down on a post-it note <laughs> that I have stuck on my laptop so that every morning I can be reminded of who I want to be in my relationships. I want to be kind and compassionate. I want to be generous and honest. I want to be accountable. These are some of the principles that I've listed for myself. And I will tell you that um, it's made a real difference in my interactions with people. It truly has. And I feel better when I behave from those principles, even in those times when I feel justified in thinking that this other person should be behaving differently. So having more peace, more serenity, I don't know, that's a good thing for me. So I try to act from my principles as often as I can. Of course, I'm not perfect. I'm human, so I'm not always going to do it, but it gives me a good intention. So. That's another, another way of thinking about how we interact in, in our noble friendship. So lastly, I wanted to uh, talk about friends, um, noble friendship from appreciating the Sangha. These teachings about friendship being the whole of this holy life remind us of how important and precious the Sangha and our relationships in it are to our own awakening and the awakening of others. As I said earlier, the Sangha is not merely helpful in realizing our spiritual path. The Sangha is the path. Collectively, we create and sustain the Sangha. This isn't to minimize the, uh, the importance of our founders or uh, our executive director, our teachers, all who have created and maintained this space for us to be in. But without us, there is no Sangha. Our presence and our commitment to being engaged, to cultivating spiritual friendship, it's essential to our own awakening and the awakening of all of us in this Sangha. It's not always easy. I was reading, um, if this was a Norman Fisher, who I love, he says, it's not unusual to be in a community, a Sangha community, he meant, with someone who pushes all your buttons. Exactly the sort of person you'd avoid at all costs in ordinary, ordinary life will appear in your Sangha. There he or she is, metaphorically your father or sister, childhood nemesis or ancient school or work enemy, sitting right across from you in the meditation hall. You have to deal with this person in ways you never would have if left to your own devices. And eventually, they can become your valued friend. So Buddha thought of the Sangha as a harmonious group of spiritual friends looking out for one another's welfare, living together in full equanimity, full equality for the spiritual development of each one. In the Mahayana Buddhist teaching, the bodhisattva clearly sees that no one could be happy or content while others are suffering. There is no individual awakening. <laughs> no one can be happy, no one can be enlightened unless everyone is happy and enlightened. So we practice together, we awaken together, and understand together. Together we go forth to do what needs to be done. So I wanted to um, 
close my talk with a blessing, a friendship blessing from a book that many of you probably know from John Donahue, To Bless the Space Between Us. John Donahue was an Irish poet and philosopher and one-time priest, mystic, um, and uh, he has a blessing in this book that's for friendship that I want to read. At the end of this um, blessing um, are the words Anamkara. And Anamkara in the Celtic world is a, world is a word for soul friend. In the early Celtic church, a person who acted as a teacher, companion, or spiritual guide was called an Anamkara. It originally referred to someone in whom you confessed, revealing the hidden intimacies of your life. So here's this blessing he wrote. May you be blessed with good friends and learn to be a good friend to yourself. Journeying to that place in your soul where there is love, warmth, and feeling. May this change you. May it transfigure what is negative, distant, or cold within your heart. May you be brought into real passion, kindness, and belonging. May you treasure your friends. May you be good to them be there for them, and receive all the challenges, truth, and light you need. May you never be isolated, but know the embrace of your Anamkara. So, thank you. Woo. Sorry about that. Um, be happy to hear a couple of comments if anybody has has comments or thoughts. Yeah, Mark. Wonderful talk, Chris. Wonderful talk. Um, uh, you touched some points I really have thought about a lot myself. Um, I, I like the idea of and and try to abide by spiritual friendships. Not that noble friendship isn't wonderful. But to me, spiritual friendship, the, the, the concept of that goes much deeper in me. And I, um, I kind of feel that it has allowed me, um, by, by sort of embodying that as best I can, and like, like everybody else, I'm really human, I don't all the time, but as, uh, as often as I can, realizing that if I maintain this spiritual awareness of myself and others, then I really see the good in others, no matter who they are, because they are spiritual entities too. The other thing I wanted to say is I can't help but uh, mention Dogen. Dogen talks about continuous practice, not sitting all the time, but continuous practice, you know, to study the self is to forget the self to forget the self is to see the 10,000 things. And the 10,000 things is the universe. It's everything. And we can't see those everythings if we're only just sitting. And so I, those are a couple of points that you, your lovely, lovely talk may help me think about. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Mark. Tanya. Yeah, so it was a gorgeous talk and beautifully delivered and you've made me choke up a few times. So thank you for that. Um, I did, however, want to make a correction on what I've mentioned before. I have only mentioned the dogs as group animals. So are the cats as well. And I've had cats and I've somehow subsumed them amid the dogs because I've had both. So. Uh, primates probably would qualify too. I guess what the, who I am excluding are only reptiles. So, so yeah. Uh, anyways, um, yes, I do believe that it is exactly as you say. The friendships are something that has to be cultivated, and without cultivation of that, um, through with a full awareness of who we are and everything else. Uh, that doesn't give us the benefits that we need in order to thrive well. So thank you so, so much. Perfect beginning for the new year. Thank you, Tanya. I'm not sure I'm seeing everybody on the screen. So if, 
uh, if there's somebody on that I'm not seeing your hand, you can just un unmute yourself and start talking. Yeah, oh, this is me, Jeremy. Um, hey, thank Jeremy. you, Chris, for, for your talk. Um, something I've been working on is, is opening up my heart. So um, when you said that this idea of um, when there's something that comes up in ourselves that we don't like, how it closes our heart, that really resonated with me to see how in those moments, that's when I really shut myself down to other people. So um, that's going to be a, a, something I can take with me is, is first giving compassion to that part of myself in order to keep the heart open. So I really appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It, wonderful talk. And I like the practical piece of um, writing on a notepad or on a sticky note, some of those principles that that I want to remember when I'm relating with others. So I'm, I'm definitely going to take that away. Thank you. It was really wonderful. Thanks. Hey, Chris, this is Christian. Um, <clears throat> so like everyone else said, wonderful talk. Um, I always just think it's it's so fascinating how our meditation practice is only really one small part of our, our bigger practice and how we compose ourselves and how we the way that we treat other people is also like an extension of that meditation practice. So I, I really appreciated um, hearing that from you. Um, and I would say that over the past, like since I've been, you know, meditating and just sitting more and doing more Zen practice. One of the things that I've noticed is like another attribute of like quality friendship is being able to um, sit with that person um, and not really feel the need to have to communicate and to almost experience gaps together. Um, I think that's something that I've been trying to get a little bit more comfortable with is is uh, just spending time with people, like quality time with people, not feeling like you need to, you know, jam pack it in with as many things as possible. So, um, but anyways, thank you. Thank you for your beautiful talk. Thank you, Christian. Well, I hope wherever you are, you either like shoveling or somebody does it for you. <laughs> the sun is coming out, so it might be a beautiful day here in Chicago. But um, thank you all for being here. Um, it's really lovely to see your faces. And uh, I look forward to when we can mo more of us can be here in person. But have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Great talk, Chris. Yeah, and great talk. Thank you. Robin, hi Julie, hi Blair, hi everybody. Hi, Eddie. Blessings, blessings. Mm. Yeah.